only mode. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Frailty Network's webinar series. Today's webinar is titled A Scoping Review of Evidence for Measuring Frailty in Hospital Settings. The presenters today will be both Olga Fayo, uh, Dalhousie University investigator, as well as uh, Kayla Mallory. Uh, before we get into the talk itself, I want to just uh, go through a few reminders. Uh, first is that uh, after the webinar, is complete. There will be a question and answer session that follows uh, Dr. Thayo's presentation. Please submit your questions online on the side panel there where under questions um, and we will answer as many questions as time permits. Just as a reminder, once the webinar is completed um, and uh, we essentially are uh, concluded, a webinar series survey will pop up on your screen and we encourage all everyone to provide feedback as to how to improve our webinar series as well as provide uh, maybe some ideas on what future webinar topics one might want to hear about from our network. The webinar slides and video will be available online for viewing one to two days uh, at our website under news and events slash webinars. Uh, just as a reminder, this webinar series is uh, at least a monthly webinar series. We try to have one webinar per month, at least. Our next webinar series, or next webinar, is Wednesday, March the 1st at noon. And it will be presented by Deborah Sheets and Stuart McDonald at the University of Victoria. Um, and it's a very interesting study based on you looking at uh, RIE assessments, and specifically RIE home care assessment tool and how multiple assessments over time could uh, better inform care practices for frail elderly individuals. Just as a reminder again, the CFN Summer Student Awards Program is uh, currently in progress. The intent to apply forms were due today uh, by noon, so that intent to apply uh, opportunity is now uh, finished or, or completed. So those that have submitted intent to apply can now begin uh, submitting their full applications which are due Tuesday, February 28th uh, by noon. And lastly, as a reminder, the Canadian Frailty Network's 2017 Annual National Conference uh, will be uh, on April 23rd and 24th at the Chelsea Hotel in Toronto. Uh, please uh, visit our website uh, later this week where our registration um, page will be up and running. So with, without further ado, I'd like to present our, um, our presenters for the webinar today. Again, that's Olga Theo. She's an assistant professor of medicine at Dalhousie University, affiliated scientist of geriatric medicine with the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and an adjunct senior lecturer of medicine with the University of Adelaide in Australia. Uh, along with Olga, Kayla Mallory will be presenting as well. She's a first year medical student at Dalhousie. She obtained her BSc in neuroscience from Dalhousie and has worked as a research assistant uh, from 2014 to 16 um, at, the universe, at Dalhousie University Geriatric Medicine Research Team under the supervision of both Dr. Theo and Dr. Kenneth Rockwood. So without further ado, um, Olga, if you would, uh, you could begin your presentation. Thank you so much, Perry, for the introduction. Uh, before we begin a presentation, we would like especially to thank the Canadian Frailty Network for funding this project and giving us the opportunity to present our findings through this uh, webinar but we'd also like to acknowledge our co-investigators and trainees who were involved in this project. You can see their names in their slide, and especially would like to thank Emma Squires, who has done such a great job with this project. 
I'm only going to do a short introduction since I'm sure the audience here is familiar with the concept of frailty. Frailty is nowadays understood as the increased vulnerability to adverse outcomes among people of the same chronological age. Frailty is more common among older adults, but not all older adults are frail. However, it's more common among those seen in clinical settings. Frail patients require adaptations of care, personalization of interventions, and modifications of standard protocols. As such, identifying frailty early in clinical care is vital. To do this, though, we need very, various instruments have been developed, but consensus has not yet been reached on what should we measure, and also choosing among the many options available can be confusing to healthcare professionals. Furthermore, all frailty measurement tools are not feasible for clinical settings. Currently, no reviews of the literature have been conducted with a general focus on frailty measures used in acute care settings. The ability of the acute care setting to cope with the influx of frail older adults may be reaching a limit, and unless changes are made in its organization, it seems inevitable that care provided to the older adult will suffer. With this in mind, we decided to do a scoping review to identify and document the nature and extent of research evidence related to frailty measurement and management in acute care settings. Scoping reviews are different from systematic reviews, which usually focus on a very specific research question. The purpose of our scoping review was very broad, and our goal was to map the literature around frailty in acute care settings. In simple terms, we wanted to find out what was out there in the literature about frailty in hospitals. To identify articles for this scoping review, we searched a wide range of academic literature databases, including Cochrane, Medline, CINEL, Embase, PsycInfo, and ERIC. We did our search strategy in September 2015, and we used the search terms all reasonable descriptors of frailty, aging, pre-hospital, and acute care. We're only looking for original research articles that were published after 2000, which is when the literature around frailty started increasing. Also keep in mind that the two most commonly used frailty tools, the frailty phenotype and the frailty index, were both published in 2001. So we felt 2000 was a good starting point for our literature search. We only kept articles that included people 65 or older who were acutely ill and were hospitalized. This means that outpatients or patients that were not acutely ill, for example, inpatients or rehabilitation units, or doing elective surgeries were not included. Also, the authors of the articles had to identify at least some of the participants as frail anywhere within the article. This means that in order for a study to be included in this review, the authors didn't have to measure frailty, just to call the participants frail. Please keep this in mind because Kayla will discuss in detail results about this. And since we were doing a scoping review, our search was not limited by language, study design and quality, or outcome measure examine. For the presentation today, we will also include some guidelines we found in the search, but we will not go in detail about them. And since our search was so broad, the number of articles we had to screen was also very big. Our database search initially resulted in almost 9,000 articles. We uploaded these articles in RefWorks, where duplicates were removed, and we end up with a little more than 6,000 articles. We uploaded these articles in the software we use for screening, the distiller SR, and two reviewers independently screened the title and abstract of these articles based on our inclusion exclusion criteria. If there was a disagreement among the two reviewers, a third reviewer was involved. Of the 6,037 articles that were screened, 2,797 were excluded on the first stage of screening. Then again, two reviewers independently screened the full text of the remaining 3,240 articles. After the stage two screening, we end up with almost 600 articles. We also hand searched a reference list of other systematic reviews on frailty, and 28 additional articles were added to make the final number of included studies to 625. So in the next stage, we extracted data from the 625 included articles. There was a lot of information presented in the included articles, so we focused on 16 questions that we were trying to answer on this scoping review. We had eight questions about the descriptive characteristics, 
of the included studies, and eight questions about frailty. For the descriptive characteristics, we wanted to know in what study, the, in what setting the studies were done, when and in what language were the studies published, in what country were the studies conducted, and how many participants were included, what the mean age of the participants was, and how many females and males were included, and finally, what the study design was. For the data extraction we did about frailty, we wanted to know how often frailty was measured, when and by whom it was measured, what type of measure and what specific scale we used, what the frailty prevalence was, for what purpose was frailty used, and if it was used to predict outcomes, what outcomes were examined. And now we'll pass the microphone to Kayla for the fun part of our presentation, the findings of our review. Thank you, Olga. So now I'm going to present some of the results from the scoping review. We have a lot of data, and this data can tell a whole lot of stories. Therefore, there's lots of graphs and images, but don't worry, I'll walk you through each one. If you remember back to the inclusion criteria, we included both studies that did not measure frailty and only identified their patients as frail, as well as studies that measured frailty. Overall, we found that 66% of the studies did not measure frailty, meaning that only 30%, 33% of the included studies measured frailty. We also found eight guidelines. We're not going to discuss the guidelines much during this presentation. So now we're going to look at the setting in which the studies were conducted. On the left, you can see a pie chart of all the 625 studies included in the scoping review. This includes both studies that measure frailty and those who identify their patients as frail or non-measured studies. Overall, the most common settings were geriatrics, emergency department, general medicine, orthopedics, and cardiology. We then stratified our analysis into two groups, the 413 studies that did not measure frailty and the 204 that did. This data is presented on the table. As you can see, the top settings are the same regardless of whether the study measures frailty. Surprisingly, less than a quarter of the studies were done in geriatrics. This number is even lower among those studies that measured frailty. So now we're going to look at when the studies were published. On the left figure, we first present all the included studies and then group them based on whether or not they measure frailty. Across all settings, about 20% were done between 2000 and 2005, around 30 between 2006 and 2010, and 50% were completed between 2011 and 2015. A higher proportion of the studies conducted between 2011 and 2000 15 were measured, indicating a trend towards measurement. The graph on the right looks at when the studies were conducted across settings. In the earlier years, most studies seemed to be done in geriatrics and orthopedics, while in the ICU, most studies were done between 2011 and 2015. Now we are trying to answer the question, in what language were the articles written? Not surprisingly, since the databases we used for the literature search included predominantly English journals, 94% of the articles were published in English. Specifically, in the studies that measure frailty, 98% were written in English. However, we also had two Italian and two Portuguese articles that measured frailty. So now we're going to look at the country in which the study was conduct were conducted. Most of the studies were done in Europe, especially Italy and the UK, and in U the US and Canada. Overall, Canada was less than some of the other countries, but had a higher proportion of measured studies, which is the far right bar. Conversely, the UK makes up a significant proportion of the total studies, but has a significantly more not measured than measured studies. So from this point on, we're only going to look at the 204 studies that measured frailty. We did not extract other data from the non-measured studies. If we look at how many participants were in these measured studies, 201 studies reported the number of participants. The remaining three studies were protocols, which is why they would not have reported how many patients were recruited. The number of study participants ranged from 9 to almost 1 million, and the median was around 200. Across settings, we see 
that these numbers are similar, with the ICU having a higher median at 421. However, it should be noted that there was only nine studies conducted in this setting. So what was the mean age of participants in the study? The bar to the far left is the total number of measured studies. Note that only 155 studied measured mean age. So this is our total for this analysis. Other studies may have reported on age range or did not report any information about age. The error bars showed range. So in all studies, the lowest mean age was 45 and the maximum mean age was over 90. Because our inclusion criteria was whether the study included any participant aged 65 or older, it is possible for the mean age to be less than 65. The central blue line represents the median and the surrounding blue box, the interquartile range. You can see that the median was around 80 and this was similar across all settings. Now we're going to look at the percent of females in the study. Out of the 204 measured studies, 187 reported on the number of females, and the median number of females was slightly greater than 50%. There were no major differences across settings. Orthopedics had a slightly higher percentage of females, but we must also consider that there was only 11 studies conducted in orthopedics. So overall, there's a good representation of males and females in the included studies. So now we're going to look at study design. Consistently across all settings, over 80% of the studies were observational. There was a small number of experimental studies and an even smaller number of qualitative studies. From the far right bar, you can see that all the ICU studies were observational. So when was frailty measured? Approximately 50% of frailty measurement was done at admission, while a small proportion of frailty measurement was done at discharge. By during hospitalization, which is represented in green, we mean that frailty was measured while the participants were in hospital, but neither at admission nor discharge. We had some study that me measured frailty at varying time points, and we qualified these as mixed. Almost 15% of the studies were done by identifying frailty through a retrospective review of charts or another administrative database. Finally, approximately 10% did not report when frailty was measured. So who measured frailty? We found that researchers and healthcare professionals measured frailty at almost equal frequency. Again, there was about 20% of the studies that did not report who conducted the frailty measurement. In the emergency department and the ICU, assessment was more likely to be done by a researcher than a healthcare staff. In geriatrics, approximately 50% were conducted by healthcare professionals, while in orthopedics, researchers measured frailty in a little less than 50% of the studies. However, in geriatrics and orthopedics, more so than in the other studies, the authors frequently did not report on who conducted the frailty measurement. So now we're going to further break down the measured studies into what tools they use to measure frailty. We classified frailty measurement as established frailty tools, ad hoc measures, clinical judgment, and non-frailty tools. 50% used an established frailty tool. By this, we mean tools that were developed specifically to measure frailty and have been validated for this purpose. An example would be the clinical frailty scale or the Edmonton frailty scale. Around 20% used an ad hoc measure which means that these scales were developed for that particular study only. For example, a study could identify participants who were over 80 with two or more chronic conditions as frail. A small proportion of studies use clinical judgment as a measure of frailty. Lastly, 20% of the studies use scales developed for other purposes, but the authors were using these scales to identify frailty. An example of this would be the Identification of Seniors at Risk, or ISAR, which was used to measure frailty. We call these non-frailty scales. You can see some vari variation among the setting. For example, in orthopedics, it is more common to use non-frailty scales, while in the ICU, most studies use established frailty tools. If we continue to look at what type of frailty tool was used, 
On the left, we are looking at type of frailty measure by year. The most recent studies are more likely to use an established frailty tool, while earlier studies were more likely to use an ad hoc measure to define frailty. On the right, we can see that Canada, in Canada, most researchers are using an established frailty tool, while in the US, the US is the only country where most ad, with the most ad hoc measures. So go Canada. Now we're going to look at specific frailty scale, um, what specific frailty scale was used. This list in, includes both established and non-frailty scales. Overall, the most commonly used scales were the clinical frailty scale, the frailty index, and the frailty phenotype. However, there's a lot of variability among the type of scales used. Other tools used to measure frailty include the identification of seniors at risk, the GEM drug study criteria, the Edmonton Frailty Scale, the Winograd Index, Vulnerable Elder Survey, Balducci Criteria, Rockwood Geriatric Frailty Scales, and others that you can see below. So here we are showing the top five scales for each setting. The Clinical Frailty Scale was used most commonly, was the most commonly used scale in geriatrics and the ICU. The frailty index was the most commonly used in the emergency department and in orthopedics, and the frailty phenotype was the most commonly used scale in cardiology. In general medicine, clinical frailty index, frailty phenotype, and the clinical or then frailty index were all equally used. We are now going to talk about how frailty was used. We found that frailty was used either as a risk stratification inclusion-exclusion criteria as an outcome or only as a descriptive measure. Almost 50% of the studies used frailty for risk stratification. By this, we mean that frailty was used to predict future adverse health outcomes. In red, you can see that about 20% used frailty as an inclusion-exclusion criterion to select participants for their studies. Only a very small proportion of studies use frailty as an outcome measure. And similarly, a few studies used a mixture of these. Almost 30% of the studies used fraily, frailty solely to describe the participants. This could, mean, this could mean looking at cross-sectional associations, such as whether older people were frailer, or reporting the frailty prevalence of the study population. By setting, there is some variability, but across all settings, risk stratification is the main reason why, fra why frailty is currently used. This means that most studies are using frailty as a predictive measure of adverse outcomes. By year, you can see that earlier, frailty was used mostly as an inclusion-exclusion criteria, while now frailty is used most commonly as a risk stratification tool. By design, we see that, as expected, Observational studies use frailty more commonly as risk stratification, while in experimental studies such as clinical trials, frailty is used mostly as an inclusion-exclusion criteria. So only 122 studies reported on frailty prevalence. Overall, approximately 50% of the study participants were characterized as frail. This is more than we usually see in community settings, which makes sense since we're looking at the clinical hospital setting and the mean age of 80, which is slightly higher than most community studies. Across settings, orthopedics had a slightly higher prevalence of frailty, but there were only five studies that reported number of participants. So now we are going to further stratify prevalence of frailty. On the far left, we break the studies into those in which participants' mean age was less than 80 versus those with a mean age over 80. We found that the, if the study included older people, the frailty prevalence was higher. Similarly, if the study included more females than males, frailty prevalence was higher. Looking at how the studies measured frailty, if the studies used a non-frailty scale, the participants were more likely to be frail versus if they used an ad hoc measure of frailty, the prevalence was the lowest. So lastly, we're going to look specifically at the studies who use frailty as a risk stratification tool to see if frailty can predict adverse outcomes. 
On the y-axis, you can see the outcomes that have been examined in the studies, with mortality being the most commonly used outcome. In blue, we can see the number of studies that showed the, that frailty was predictive of mortality, while in red, you can see the number of studies that showed that frailty did not predict mortality. As expected, not all studies looked at mortality as an outcome, but only 70 studies did look at mortality risk, and most studies found that frailty was predictive. Other commonly used adverse outcomes were length of stay, institutionalization, and complication. Overall, across all outcomes, most studies showed that frailty is predictive. Falls, delirium, and cognitive decline are three outcomes that seem not to be predicted by frailty, but not many studies looked at these specific outcomes. So here we're combining all adverse outcome together and are looking at what percentage of studies showed a predictive association between frailty and adverse health outcomes. 80% of the time that frailty was used to predict an outcome, there was a significant association between frailty and the outcome. When we look by setting, there are similar results. In the ICU, there was a slightly lower predictive power of frailty while in general medicine, the predictive power was slightly higher. So in this slide, we're still combining all outcomes and looking overall how many studies were predictive and how many were not predictive of adverse outcomes. However, we're now stratifying by type of frailty measure. Similar across 80%, approximately 80% were predictive when established scales were used. Ad hoc had a slightly higher predictive rate both studies that use clinical judgment to predict outcomes were predictive, while non-frailty scales had a slightly lower predictive rate. Therefore, using a non-frailty scale, studies are less likely to predict outcomes. By specific frailty tool, we found that the best predictive rate was with the frailty index and the Edmonton frailty scale. Next, the clinical frailty scale was the most predictive of outcomes, with the frailty phenotype and the identification of senior at risk having a lower predictive rate than the other scales. Further investigations need to be done, for example, using meta-analysis to examine these relationships further. So now I'm going to pass the mic back over to Olga so she can summarize all those results I just presented. Thank you, Kayla. So regarding the setting, we found that there was a lot of variability, but the most common settings were geriatrics, emergency department, and general medicine. We actually found fewer studies than we expected conducting geriatrics. Regarding the year of publication, almost 50% of the studies were done in the last four years examined. The number was even bigger when we only looked at the studies which measured frailty. This shows that the literature of frailty is increasing exponentially. Regarding the language, most articles were written in English, but this could be related to the databases we examined. Regarding the countries, most studies were done in US, UK, Canada, and other European countries. We don't know a lot about frailty in other countries, especially from Asia and Africa. Most studies included more than 100 participants, and the median was around 200. The median age of the population was around 80, which is very typical for aging studies and there was a good representation of males and females. Also, majority of studies were observational. We only found a very small amount of clinical trials and qualitative studies. Regarding how often frailty was measured, we found that only one-third of the studies actually measure frailty. In most cases, authors called their participants frail without providing any definition or measurement tool for frailty. In the studies that measure frailty, Authors mention that most of them, most of the time, frailty is measured at admission by either a healthcare professional or a researcher. The frailty prevalence was reported at approximately 50%, much higher than we, what we usually see in the community, where prevalence among older adults is reported around 20 to 25%. In most cases, established frailty tools were used, but ad hoc measures were actually quite common, especially in the earlier years. We found a lot of variability among the scales used, more than 20 scales. But it was clear that the most popular scales were the clinical frailty scale, the frailty index, and the phenotype. When we examined for what purpose frailty was used, 
we found that most of the times researchers use frailty in hospital settings to predict adverse health outcomes. In that case, mortality, length of stay, admission to nursing home, and complications were the most common outcome measures. Overall, frailty seems to be a good predictor of adverse health outcomes. Less than 20% of the time, studies show that frailty didn't predict an adverse health outcome. When we looked at all the findings from this review, we have to keep in mind some limitations. Some are related to the type of the review we did. We wanted to do a scoping review, so our scope was very broad, and we didn't include quality assessment and meta-analysis. We thought that that was appropriate first step. Now that we identified where we have enough research evidence, we need to try to answer more focused research questions using meta-analysis and other quantitative techniques in order to synthesize the evidence. Another limitation is that we may have missed articles published in non-English journals, not including the databases we searched. Also, we only included studies which had inpatients over the age of 65 and who were acutely ill. There are many other studies that focus on frailty in hospitalized patients, for example, from rehabilitation units or dialysis units or elective surgeries. Also, possibly, there are more studies that measure frailty but didn't report it. Among the studies that did report it was a great variability in the measurement tools used for frailty. This makes the synthesis of the data very challenging. And finally, we didn't do a review of the gray literature. We tried to do it, but it was impossible as the term frailty has been widely used and many times as a synonym of aging. So what do we learn from this scoping review? What are the known knowns? We know that within the hospital setting, most studies were done in non-geriatric settings between 2011 and 2015 in North America or Europe. Most of the studies identify participants as frail without measuring frailty, and as time passed, frailty as a concept was more commonly used across all settings. But also, as time passed, researchers were more likely to use established frailty tools. We found that the most commonly used scales were the clinical frailty scale, the frailty index, and the frailty phenotype. Most studies were observational and used frailty tools to predict adverse health outcomes, especially mortality and institutionalization. When we looked at specific scales, the frailty index and the endocrine scales seem to have the best predictive ability. But what research gaps does this review identify? What are the known unknowns? Frailty was rarely used in experimental and qualitative studies and was rarely used as an outcome measure. Frailty was mostly used in three to four settings, and we don't have a lot of information for other clinical settings. When frailty was used to predict outcomes, rarely patient-oriented measures were included, such as function and quality of life. And since almost no clinical trials have been conducted with a focus on frailty, we don't know whether frailty identification can improve clinical decision making within, within hospitals. But also we don't know what clinicians need to do after they identify someone as frail. And overall we still have very limited evidence whether identifying and managing frailty will improve care. We believe that it will do, but we don't have the evidence to strongly support this yet. We need these questions to be answered in order to implement frailty assessment and management plans in clinical practice and to start discussing about changes in policy. We need to fill in these research gaps in order to move forward. So what can be action items for future research? We should only identify someone as frail if we measure frailty. We don't need a new type of ageism, what a colleague has identified as frailism. Also, those who do studies on frailty have to be very clear on their methodology. We want to know who does the assessment of frailty and when, and all the details about the scale that they used. And ideally, researchers should use validated frailty tools to measure frailty. We need that if we want to see this field moving forward. We should use more patient-oriented outcome measures in our studies, but we should also do more qualitative studies about what frailty means for patients, caregivers, and clinicians. And if there are any potential harms if we start labeling people as frail within our healthcare system. And finally, what I think we need to do more than anything, we need randomized clinical trials to tell us what clinicians need to do after identifying someone as frail. 
how clinicians should modify their treatment plans based on frailty, how frailty will impact their clinical decision making, and also what can they do to prevent or reverse the frailty level of their patients. And before we finish, on behalf of all co-investigators, we would like to acknowledge some people who helped us with this scoping review, such as helping us with the translation of the non-English articles. Of course, we would like to thank the Canadian Frailty Network for funding this project and for you for participating in our webinar. Please let us know what you think about our project or if you have any suggestions, comments. In this slide, you can see our contact information. Also, as I mentioned earlier, the scope of this project was very broad, so we couldn't focus too much on too many details, but if anyone is interested in collaborating to look at specific components, we'll be happy to do that. For example, if someone wants to do a systematic review on just the general medicine data, or only on studies that examine length of stay, we'd be happy to share our data and collaborate. Please email us. Again, thank you for listening to our presentation. Great. Thank you, Olga, and uh, thank you, Kayla, as well, for uh, an excellent presentation. Certainly a lot of uh, data to uh, think about. Uh, we've, uh, again, I want to encourage people to submit their questions um, online uh, through the uh, side window pane there under questions. Um, we've got a few questions, uh, Olga and Kayla. So uh, I'll start off with, uh, with one of the questions I had in terms of um, you know, your next steps and call to action, which I thought were great, and uh, I agree with the uh, suggestion of uh, encouraging more uh, randomized clinical trials in terms of interventions and so forth. But I was curious in terms of um, established frailty tools and sort of the uses of the various frailty tools. What can we, can we learn anything from the different tools that we're using in different settings and, and whether there's some reasons or um, sort of guidelines in terms of which tools should be used in, in which uh, care settings and so forth. Is that something that uh, uh, you would encourage the development of or is that something best left to the individual investigator and clinician? I think what our review showed is that there is a lot of variability which means some tools may seem to be more appropriate for some specific settings and I think this is what made some researchers use, for example, the ICER used more in the emergency department or things like that, because some, some uh, clinicians might want to use tools that are more familiar with, even to identify frailty. There is a little bit of problem there whether this is actually a frailty tool or it was actually capturing something else. So I definitely would suggest, and from what we see, to actually try to use an established frailty tool if we actually start measuring frailty. And even though there is being the whole thing about different tools for different uh, measurements for different settings, I think it will help at least within the same hospital if we have some type of standardization in order to make the discussion a little bit better. So if we say mild frail, if hopefully that would mean something similar across the different units of the hospital or across clinicians and policy makers. Right. Um, absolutely. Um, Something sort of similar in the same sort of line of questioning. Uh, one of the questions that uh, I've received online is, uh, first of all, very impressive body of work. Um, the question is, in your opinion, which frailty tools should be used and in which context to conduct observational or experimental research? Um, I'll definitely suggest for if someone's using it as an experimental and they're using frailty as an outcome measure, it needs to be a tool that has to be sensitive to change. And we don't have a lot of evidence about which ones are more sensitive or not, but if you use more like a screening tool that are less likely to change with your intervention, then this tool might less likely show the frailty change of the participants. So definitely there is some more for example, the more comprehensive a frailty tool will be doing, like the frailty index, the admin of frail scale, which has involved more items, are more likely to be sensitive to change on, uh, on the frailty level of the participants. Versus if you want to use more for predicting outcomes and you don't need the frailty tool for care planning, then more simple screening tools could be used. Right. Okay. 
Uh, just in relation to uh, predicting outcomes and the risk stratification, I know um, Kayla presented sort of a change in the type of studies uh, in terms of how frailty measurements were used in terms of using it as an ex inclusion exclusion criteria early on in the 2000s uh, range publications. And then it, it sort of shifted toward uh, risk stratification and a, a predictive tool. Uh, any thoughts on why there was this shift and does that tell us anything about where we are in, the, in our knowledge about frailty and sort of the research community as a large? Uh, I think it goes with a little bit, in the beginning people see it as more, okay, we can now do a study specific on non-frail people or pre-frail people or frail people. So it was more used on the very, like, selecting your participants versus now they realize that there's more into that than just selecting people and start using as, the first thing that was, the idea was, can frailty tell me who is more likely to stay in the hospital longer or who is more likely to lose their function while in their hospital? things like that. And I think now the shift, it's slowly, but I do think goes more a little bit on the clinical trials of, okay, now we measured frailty, what can we do with it? So I think it's a little bit, the, a little bit of the history of the frailty literature we see here of how the concept of frailty changed over time. Yeah, it's very interesting how things are changing over time. I thought that was a, a neat data point. Um, sort of related to that, I have a question here about um, ad hoc uh, measure of frailty or determination of frailty and, and why, I, th I think one of your data slides showed that why ad hoc um, um, frailty measure was more predictive uh, than some of the other tools? It was about, uh, about the prediction, I think, for recertification. And again, yes. I mean, we didn't do a meta-analysis, right? So we're more quantitative trying to synthesize our evidence. So this need, things needs to investigate further, and there is so much variability among the ad hoc measures. So we don't know if there is, it's possible looking through them, we might find something that drives more the relationship than others. But that was with putting them together, that's as looking at the overall, we saw that they were better predictive rate than other, the non-failed scales. But I, I didn't have a very strong observation about it. But again, most likely people used the ad hoc measures might be more clinical relevant than some other measures that may have been used. I think also the problem with the ad hoc measure is that there was like there was so much variability. So people could choose any characteristic and then identify them as frail. So they're grouped together in this in this ad hoc group, but they're not necessarily super similar. So it's something. I um, I, I have a sort of a, a similar question from another individual in terms of the ad hoc. Uh, what was, uh, maybe define what ad hoc is in terms of this process? So we mainly classified studies as ad hoc measures if they weren't using an established tool of any type. So they were just listing characteristics and if the participant fit into this characteristics then they were then they were frail. So it could either be two or more of the following characteristics or that they had this group of um, characteristics. And typically those are definitions of frailty developed for a specific article and then use again for another article. Sometimes they may have, like if it was a big study, they may have used this criteria in two or three publications, but typically not outside that study. This, mm -hmm. this definition will be seen again. Okay, I see. Um, so, so a question of mine is, did, did the larger studies that perhaps had multi-site um, trial sites versus very small single-site uh, studies, were there, uh, was there a sort of a pattern in terms of um, smaller sites using maybe an ad hoc method versus multi-sites where you almost by definition need to standardize how one measures frailty or observes frailty? We haven't looked at that in big in a lot of detail, but it's interesting, for example, if you remember the list of uh, scales we presented, actually the GM, GM drug trial is one of the most commonly used, and that's because that is a big study that used the same criteria for all their publications for a scale they developed. So this is something that possibly could skew a little bit the results of a big study with multiple publications. Yeah, but we haven't looked too much into what the size of the study in relation to the type of frailty tool used. But again, it's something we can look into. It's just with so much data, we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have 
tons of data there. That's a very interesting study. Um, I've got so many questions here. Um, just a pretty straightforward question uh, from your scope re scoping review. Which aspects of frailty measurement is important to, is important to justify who is frail? Can you repeat that again? Sorry. Yes, from your scoping review, which aspect of frailty measurement is is maybe most important to justify who is frail? Um, I suspect it's a straightforward answer, but. I'm not sure if I, I don't sure if like if it's like from the type type of frailty scale. Yeah, I think that's probably what it's getting at in terms of which frailty scales are, are maybe better than others, and um, obviously some are used more than others, such as a clinical frailty scale. Yeah. But in your opinion, um, is there something? Is there a, maybe is there a tool that could be improved or, or maybe added on to? I think we still have to find tools that are. We have to look more at the implementation piece, what is feasible to be mm -hmm. used in clinical settings and possible across different settings. And we don't have a lot of evidence around the feasibility, around of the scales, and is it possible the same scale to use in cardiology and orthopedics and ICU, things like that. We don't have a lot of evidence around. But definitely, as a type of frailty scale, I think we need to move more on the established frailty tools. OK. Um, fair enough. Um, here's a question that uh, sort, of, uh, sort of came to mind when I was uh, listening to your slides as well. Is, um, so the question is, uh, first of all, uh, um, they thank you for the presentation. Um, but the question is, did anyone comment about the challenges for measuring frailty while in hospital? Example, how, how is it likely to change when the current health issue is met or not? So I think maybe w what this individual is asking is, uh, which, some, which occurred to me as well, is frailty is assessed in hospital, um, maybe at a, during admission or discharge. But it, does one ever consider, sort of, in terms of, especially in terms of predictive uh, capability, whether that individual is frail uh, two weeks or a month prior to admission or a number of months after discharge? And it's, it's generally the whole idea about frailty. Is frailty your baseline status, like the stat how you looked two weeks ago or a month ago before you came to the hospital, versus how your acute state has an effect on your health? So it's a lot different of, ideally, we need more than one static assessment. We need to know how this person looked before, looked like before, how they looked when they came to the hospital, and how they look when they leave the hospital. And I think that's what we need our scale. That's why I was talking before about sensitivity change. We need scales that ideally would capture these changes. And I think that, especially the baseline, the real baseline level, I think is going to be very more important for care planning of can we make this patient look like how they look like two weeks ago or a month ago while they're in the hospital. Yeah, I also think this is something that we did identify is that a lot of the studies only measured frailty at one time point. So they would only measure frailty when the person came into the hospital or when they were leaving, but didn't sort of have that baseline measurement to compare with to see how, how their hospitalization has affected their baseline state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like that might be very important. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of questions sort of related to uh, one of the slides. So, um, I'm going to try to paraphrase a number of these questions, but essentially, um, Kayla, I think you had shown a, a slide where uh, Canada was very good at uh, using uh, sort of standard frailty measurement tools, whereas other countries such as uh, US wasn't so good. And something that occurred to me was the UK was similar to the US in this respect. Um, any thoughts on why that was that that is the case or was the case, especially since uh, countries like the UK, in some respects, are further along in terms of understanding of frailty and implementation of uh, these tools in more of a real clinical setting? We we might be biased a little bit because <laughs> two of the three most commonly used scales were developed actually by our group in Halifax, so <laughs> we're actually more likely to publish with them. So. I think it's one of the main reasons that, yeah, it's the frailty index and the clinical frailty scale and the ambient frail scale, they're all developed in Canada. Right. So it would make sense that they're actually used more here, here before they start using abroad. I see. 
in terms of actually the use of those tools, um, was there any trend in terms of, uh, I know you showed us a sort of summary slide, but was there a trend towards uh, more use of those tools over time by these other countries? We haven't looked at that yet, actually. That's a good yeah, question. Yeah, that's though. a good question. That's something we haven't looked at is what, yeah, what specific scales are used in specific countries. But that's definitely something we could look into. Okay, that's, uh, that's great. Um, I think that pretty much covers most of the questions. Um, uh, there's a few others, but I think uh, some of the answers you've given sort of uh, touch upon those. So um, I think uh, I think we've come to the conclusion in terms of our Q and A session. There are a number of comments in terms of thanking you for a great presentation, and they look forward to the published results. Um, so in conclusion, I just want to thank uh, both uh, Olga and Kayla again for. Uh, a great presentation and thank the audience for attending today's webinar and I just want to remind everyone that our next webinar is March the 1st 2017 uh, presented by Deborah Sheets. Uh, thank you again everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.